So in week one, we talked that Jesus was our wonderful counselor, that he is a supernatural source of help and of hope in a time of need. And then last week, Pastor Stephen from Foothill came through and, and he talked to us about mighty God, that Jesus is our mighty God who delivers us from sin. When we are weak, he is strong. And this week we are gonna look at everlasting father. So if we think about the succession of the names of Jesus in Isaiah nine, what we looked at last week was the power of Jesus. This, what we're looking at today is the personal nature of Jesus. Not only is Jesus incredibly powerful, he is intimately personal. He is with us, God with us. So one of my favorite episodes of The Office is a hard turn. One of my favorite episodes of The Office is when Michael invites everyone into the conference room and he says, hey, now's your moment to share everything bad you've ever done while on company time. If you've ever stolen from the company or you've ever broken the rules or whatever else, and Meredith ends up getting in some serious trouble for what she confesses. But Michael decides to lead off the confession time and Holly's standing next to him. She's kind of squirming a little bit. I don't know where this is going. And Michael says this, when I discovered YouTube, I didn't work for five days. I did nothing. I watched Cookie Monster sing Chocolate Rain about a thousand times. <laughs> Has anyone ever seen that video? Cookie Monster sing Chocolate Rain? That movie is, oh, you guys gotta look that up later. Not right now, later. Now, the point is not the office. I just love the office. I'm gonna weave it into a sermon. I'm going to. The point is YouTube. I, I don't spend much time on YouTube. Like I've never uh, been one to find myself falling into the YouTube black hole, you know, where you turn on the first video and it's like up next and starting in three, two, one, boom, next video. And three hours later, you look up and your eyes are kind of, you gotta rub your eyes a little bit. You're like, what just happened to me? How did I get lost on YouTube for three hours? That's just, I've just never done that. But the one YouTube type of video that will really draw me in are those videos where soldiers return home from deployment. Anyone ever seen those videos and they surprise their families? Like I, I'm, not, I'm not an easy like crier, but those videos, man, those get me real fast. And, and what's going on if you've never seen them is, is the soldier has been on deployment for six, eight, nine months uh, over in the Middle East. And then he gets to come home. His time is up and, and he shows up unannounced. And, and some examples, maybe the son has like a wrestling match and the dad walks out in the referee kind of uniform and the son's like, whoa, my dad's here. What? And there's just shocked and surprised or the, the daughter has a dance recital and the dad comes out and they have a slow dance together. Or there's a, a family dinner and he kind of knocks on the door as the delivery man and everyone is shocked. And, and at the bottom of being moved by those videos, for me at least, is kind of a sense of this is how things are supposed to be. Like oftentimes, not every time, but oftentimes the soldier is a man and he's been separated from his family for nine years. And at that moment, he returns home. They're, they're reunited. They have family dinner together. Like a man is not supposed to miss nine months worth of basketball games or nine months worth of performance. And, and we get, I'm thankful for our soldiers and for their service and that sacrifice that they give to us. But man, at that moment of reuniting, it's, there's a feeling of this is right. This is how things are supposed to be. And what we're celebrating this morning with Jesus' coming is that he has made way for us back to the Father where we can be reunited and we can have that sense of relief that this is right. This is how things are supposed to be. In our sin, we have separated ourselves from our Father, but the Son came to deliver us back to the Father. And when we come back to him in right relationship, we get that moment where it's like, oh, I'm supposed to be with my Father. I'm not supposed to be an orphan. I'm supposed to be an adopted son, adopted daughter of the Most High God. And so we are celebrating today that things have been made right by Jesus. Now, I recognize when I say the word Father that there's a lot of emotions that are going on in this room. Like some of us, we're gonna put up a blockade and we're gonna say, I, I'm, I'm not even, I'm gonna start packing up my stuff and, and take off, that's not for me. Or maybe there's a lump in our throat because we loved our fathers dearly, but they're no longer with us. Or there's a pit in our stomach and it's driven by, by jealousy of I wish I had what my friends had because my father was worthless. 
And I recognize we all came in here carrying different stories as it pertains to a father. And I just want to put everything on the table and be honest with one another today that every single person in this room is carrying some type of emotion when it comes to their own fathers, regret, loss, pain, whatever it might be. It's not just a few of us, it's all of us. And so if we can just be honest today and enter into this process and and refuse to put the lens of our earthly fathers upon our heavenly father and see how good he is and how loving he is. And so let me just rehearse some of those stories so we can be honest together. Maybe you have a story of a father who was aloof. Maybe he was present in the flesh, but the affection was never there. In years of pastoral ministry, as I've counseled other men in my life and, and, and gotten to the root of what's going on, why are they stuck in this sin? What's going on in their hearts and in their minds? A lot of times what I discover is that they had a father that never hugged them. They had a father that never looked them in the eye and said, I'm proud of you, I love you. And they're going into the wrong sources to try and find that source of pride or that source of love or embrace from a father. Maybe you have the story of abandonment. Maybe you've never met your father. You've even found him on social media and reached out to him, but he refuses to engage with you. Maybe you're a single mom in this room and your child's father is nowhere to be seen or heard from. Maybe you have the story of a cruel father. Maybe he was there. He protected you. He provided for you, but he ruled the home with an iron fist. And the house, the culture in the house was driven more by fear than by love. And you were always walking on eggshells because you were scared to get in trouble for saying or doing the wrong thing. Maybe you have the story of unreliability, where you look into the crowds on the day of your performance and he was nowhere to be seen. He had promised to come, but he got caught late at the office again. Maybe you have the story of repeated brokenness, where your dad was going to come back to the family and he got close to you and to your mom again, but the second he got close enough, he got scared and he took off yet again. Maybe you have the story of a really good father, one who affirmed you, who showed up for you who shepherded you, who provided for you, who protected you. And yet, because he is human like all of us, he still lets you down. He is flawed and sinful. And so all of us are carrying some type of hurt when it comes to thinking about father. Regardless of your story, there's a tender spot within each of us when it comes to the word father. And the reason why is we were created to have relationship with our father. And at the Advent season, we celebrate there is now a way to do that. There is a way to have perfect relationship with our perfect father through the son, Jesus Christ. And so let us just corporately step into the emotion, the pain, the hurt, and let's walk through it together by the grace of God and see what he has for us. And so here's a brief outline of how we're going to look at this. First, Jesus shows us the father in his concern for us. Second, Jesus shows us the Father in his care for us. And then third, Jesus shows us the Father in his correction of us. That's kind of the outline, concern, care, correction. But before I jump into the outline, I need to do a little bit of teaching here for a second. So uh, historically, an Orthodox Christian, a true Christian is a Trinitarian Okay, and we at Story Church are Trinitarians. I realize I just used a really big word there. Let me explain that for a second. I'm gonna go ahead and put a slide up. Do we have that slide? Now, let me say something about this. This text can be really confusing. How can the son be the father? Well, well, the short answer to that is he's not. Okay, but Jesus has come to show us the Father. So so here is what we're saying when we say Trinity. We are saying that Father, Son, and Spirit are all 100% God, fully God. There's no debate about that. The Bible says the Father is God, the Son is God, and the Spirit is God. And so we celebrate there is one God of the Bible. And yet we also celebrate that there are three distinct persons within the Trinity, within the Godhead. And so there's distinction in role and personality and personhood. So the Son is not the Spirit. The Spirit is not the Father, and the Father is not the Son. So we, as Christians, are saying we believe in one God, in three persons. 
And when Isaiah is saying that the son is an everlasting father, what he's actually saying is that the son has come to show us the father, to display the father to us. And the New Testament will echo this everywhere. We've been walking through Colossians as a church before Advent. And and here's what we saw in Colossians chapter one, that the son, that Jesus Christ is the image of the invisible God. He, the fullness of the deity of God dwells within him bodily. And then in Hebrews chapter one, we hear that the son, Jesus Christ, is the radiance of the glory of God. He is the exact imprint of the divine nature. And so the best way to sum this up is is to say this, the invisible God, the father, the creator of all things, if you want to know what he looks like, look at the son. If you want to know who the father is, look at the son. So the son came and he was given to us to show us who the father is and what the father is like. And not only that, but the son came to make way for us to have a relationship with the father. It is only through the son that we can have access to the father and be restored to relationship with him. We see this in John chapter 14, 6 through 10. Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known my father also. From now on, you do know him and you have seen him. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the father and it is enough for us. Jesus said to him, have I been with you so long and you still do not know me, Philip? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does his works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or else believe on account of the works themselves. So what we see within the Godhead, even though there's three distinct persons, there's one will, one purpose, one nature. And Jesus Christ came to fulfill that will on earth. And so the Bible will teach the will of God on earth is this. God is going to glorify himself by reconciling sinners back to him. That's the purpose of God in this world. He is going to glorify his great name by saving sinners like us. And we see the three persons within the Godhead playing their different roles in this purpose. So the father initiates salvation by sending the son. The son accomplishes salvation by dying on the cross in our place. And the spirit applies salvation by breathing his life into our dead hearts and bringing us to new life in Jesus. One will, one purpose, one nature, but the three persons do it in a distinct way role. They accomplish it in a distinct role. And so when Isaiah is saying the son is the father, he's saying the son has come to accomplish the father's will, to do the father's bidding, to show us the father and to bring us back to the father. Okay. So I just wanted to talk about that a little bit and and teach a little bit on good Trinitarian doctrine because Christians are Trinitarian. And I just don't want any of us to be confused here on this text. Okay. So the three ways Jesus is going to show us the father and do the father's work is he's going to show concern for us. He's going to care for us and he's going to correct us. Okay. So first point, Jesus shows us the father in his concern for us. Jesus shows us the father in his concern for us. Now, when we're talking about concern, I don't mean kind of the the 2019 co-opted definition of concern. What I do not mean is that Jesus is kind of anxious or worried about us or anxious or worried about our future because we've taken the word concern and we've turned it into anxiety or worry. Here's what I mean by that. At the bottom of anxiety and worry is a recognition that you and I have very little control over our lives. And we worry about the future because we know that the future is unknown and we have no control over it. Maybe, Maybe a couple of examples to explain that. 
Uh, maybe you're, you have an adult child in, uh, you're in this room and you have an adult child and, and maybe you raised that child in the faith and they were baptized at a young age. They read their Bible. They went to youth group and then they graduated and went off to college. They took off. They've never been back to church since. You're not sure about their faith or where they're at with the Lord or, or, or if they want to hear from you and you try to engage them, but they want nothing to do with it. And what we'll say is I'm concerned about my child's future. And a lot of times what we're actually saying is I'm anxious or I'm worried about my child because in the middle of that, we're recognizing I can't control my child's faith journey. I can't make them go back to church. I can't make them read their Bible or love Jesus or engage in God's mission. I cannot force that. Or maybe you're about to graduate college or grad school and you're looking out at the job market and things aren't very promising. Maybe, maybe in your particular field, people are waiting longer before they retire. Or maybe the stock market dip has affected uh, your ability to find a job. Or maybe your job's going to require a big move and lower pay. And what you, you'll say, we're, we're, I'm concerned about my future. But what actually we're saying in the middle of that is I'm, I'm anxious about my future because I can't control the job market. I can't force my way into a job. Now, when I'm saying that Jesus shows concern for us, I'm not saying Jesus is worried about our future. Jesus doesn't need to worry. Jesus has nothing to worry about because in worry and anxiety at the bottom of it is a recognition that we have very little control. So God uses worry and anxiety as a tool to show us that we are finite creatures who wage very little control over our world. But God uses worry and anxiety to show us not only our inability, but to show us his ability. Where we are finite, he is infinite. Where we are weak, he is strong. Where we are out of control, he is absolutely sovereign and supreme and in control over all things. And so when I say Jesus shows concern for us, I'm not saying he's out of control and he's looking at our futures and he's like scratching his head. I don't know how I'm gonna figure this one out. I don't know how I'm going to take care of their future. I don't know how I'm going to get him a job. I don't know how I'm going to repair that relationship for them. When when I'm saying Jesus is concerned for us, what I am saying is Jesus pays attention to us. Jesus is aware of us. You cannot have concern for things you neglect. You cannot have concern for something you aren't paying attention to. So Jesus is showing us the everlasting father's character in the way he pays attention to us. Psalm 103 will say it this way. As a father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. For he knows our frame. He remembers we are dust. When you hear compassion, hear concern. God and his father heart is compassionate towards us and compelled by his compassion. He knows us and he remembers us. I don't know what that does for you to remember that the omnipotent God of the universe, the all-powerful creator God of the universe sees me and knows me and not just me, but everything I'm facing in this world. I don't know what that does for you, but for me, that causes a lot of comfort to come in my heart. Um, Just in the past few weeks, I'll just put my own life on display here. In the past few weeks, Katie and I have had a lot of what we'll call ownership issues. We've been there before, okay? Uh, Where everything we own has broken down and gone kaput. So first, our house starts to break down. The coldest week of the year, probably the coldest week ever in California, our heater takes a complete dive and I'm driving back and forth to Home Depot to try and spend way too much money on firewood to heat our house up. And so that takes a dive and then uh, the garage door breaks had to replace the motor on that. Our solar panels take a dive. Our kitchen sink takes a dive. I'm thankful for my dad because he fixed it all. I didn't have to. Um, I don't know how to, if we're being honest. Um, So that takes a dive, our house, and then our cars start taking a dive. So Katie's alternator and battery goes out. So we're juggling one cars and we're looking at Wells Fargo and we're like, all right, let's move some things around. We got a rainy day fund. I guess that's for cars too, not just houses. Let's, let's fix that thing. And then our children started to break down. We don't own our children, but we kind of do. Um, (laughs) 
And so Peyton ends up in urgent care with what they thought was pneumonia, just a double ear infection. So praise God for that. Owen pops a 1034, and then we start breaking down. So I spent the night wrapped up around a toilet because I ate the Thanksgiving food. My own fault. That should, shouldn't have done that. It's never good and it's never worth it. Um, so, and I ended up in urgent care with a chainsaw accident. Okay. So I, that sounds way sexier than it was. I was just... <laughs> I decided to cut a tree down barefoot. It was my own fault. (laughs) I ended up in urgent care. Katie's got a cold, she's sick. And and I'm sitting here and I'm looking at everything in my life spinning out of control, which is why Stephen preached last week. Praise God for him. And I'm just sitting there saying, man, I don't know if we have the money for this. I don't have time to handle all of this. And then I'm looking at my kids and I'm like, man, I want my kids to be better, but I can't get them better. I don't want my wife to get sick, but I can't prevent that. And here's what I'm recognizing in all of it. I have no control to determine when my heater breaks, when my car breaks, when my kids get sick, how quickly they get better, what type of cold they get. I can't control those things. I can't heal my children. I'd love to, but I can't. And then in the midst of all of that freak out, the Lord ministered to me through this text when I remembered he's an everlasting father where he's, he knows what's going on. He remembers what's going on. And not only that, but he's with us right in the middle of it. Where we are overwhelmed by all the situation in our life going out of control, God is right in the middle of it. And where we're overwhelmed, he's not. Where we're scared, he's not. Where we're exhausted, he is not. And I know many of the stories in this room, you hear my story and you're like, I'd take that over what I got going right now. Hear this, God is with you. The Father is with you right in the middle of this. He knows, he sees, he remembers. The Father is concerned with you. And if we ever think he is not concerned with us, we just need to remember the story of salvation where the Son of God was enthroned in heaven in perfection. He took on flesh and he came and dwelt in this fractured, broken, dirty world with us. And not only did he do that, but he took our own sin on his shoulders and he died in our place. Jesus is so concerned with us. The Father is so concerned with us that he left perfection to come into the muck and mire to save us up out of it. So Whatever situation you got going right now, the Father sees, the Father knows, and the Father is concerned with it. He is right with you in it. So first, Jesus shows us the Father in his concern for us. But second point, Jesus shows us the Father in his care for us and the way he cares for us. This takes the previous point just a step further. There's a difference between concern and care. Okay. Concern is awareness. Concern is seeing something of remembering something of of fixing your eyes upon something. Care is actively moving to solve that problem. You see the difference there? Concern is awareness. Care is action. And so God sees us in his concern and compelled by his grace. He comes and cares for us. There's, it's one thing to see someone's need. It's an entirely different thing to go meet that need. So Uh, You guys know this probably by now, but I'm not naturally a caretaker personality, right? Shocker. I have a lot of concern for people, but the the care side is just, it takes a little more work for me. I'm growing in it by God's grace. But I had a coworker in Texas that was just this total caretaker personality. And so an example of how he put that on display, uh, we had a member of our church in Texas that was uh, born paralyzed uh, from the neck down. And he spent his entire life just uh, at home with his parents. And as he got older, eventually his parents passed on and he ended up in a mobile home park where he was living on government assistance and and, and, and the relying, relying upon his neighbors and his family and his friends just to survive day by day. And so this guy, uh, he couldn't attend church services. He couldn't serve. He couldn't participate in a group. He was homebound, but he listened to our sermons. He gave to church. He prayed for the church. He was a member of our church. And so oftentimes our team would go visit him. We'll call him Brian. We would go visit Brian. And when I went to go visit Brian, I would sit with him. I would pray with him. I would read the scriptures to him. I would have conversation. I would try to encourage him, but that's just about as far as I got. 
And then one time my coworker said, hey, come with me and, and watch this. And on the way to Brian's house, we stopped at the local Walmart and we went in and this guy, my coworker, out of pocket spent probably $1,000. He got new bedding, new sheets, all kind of clothes, groceries, fresh water, ice, firewood, the whole nine yards, you name it. And we drove to Brian's house. We pull up and we just begin unloading these things in his home. And, and in the process, we're taking trash out and we're, we're taking all the dirt away and we're sweeping the ramp up to his front door. And then we get inside and my coworker sits down with Brian and he, he makes a hot soup and he's sitting there spoon feeding Brian ladle by ladle so that Brian can eat. And he's praying with him and encouraging him. And then as I'm just blown away at this point. He says, hey, Brian, let's go. And they take, their, they take off to the back where the bathroom is, where my coworker proceeds to undress Brian completely, give him a sponge bath, put him in new clothes, get him back in his wheelchair. And then we go into Brian's bedroom where his sheets and his, his comforter are completely spoiled. And he takes them off and he puts all the brand new things on. And then we just spent more time with him. He stocked his fridge. He cooked him a bunch of meals. And, and, and we just, it was just an incredible display of care from my coworker. You see, I didn't naturally think, how can I feed Brian? How can I shower Brian? How can I change his, his sheets? But my friend who was a natural caretaker saw that and he actively moved within Brian's needs and he cared for him. And God cares for us in the same way. Not only does he see and remember and know every situation you're facing right now, he is actively moving towards you in the middle of it. He is caring for you. He is not distant saying, I'm aware of what's going on, but he is near saying, let me help you right in the middle of this. And we see this all over the Bible, God's care for his people. God's people in the Old Testament, they were called Israel. And Israel found themselves in captivity in Egypt for hundreds of years where they did slave labor and they were ruled with, with, uh, under the thumb of an oppressive regime. And eventually God powerfully delivers Israel and they says, go back to the promised land where you're gonna dwell with me forevermore. And so they get delivered from their slavery and they're moving on towards the promised land, but they find themselves in this wilderness period where they're taking step by step to try and get into the promised land. And this is just a picture of the Christian experience where we ourselves were in our own Egypt, in our own sin and captivity. And Jesus through the cross mightily delivers us from our chains and says, you are now my child. And he promises us the new heavens and the new earth where we'll dwell with him forever. He gives us our own promised land. But in the in-between, this Christian life is a wilderness experience where we just take step by step towards glory. And so God in the Old Testament, he worked and cared for his people Israel and he's doing it for us now. Listen to Deuteronomy chapter one. The Lord, your God, who goes before you will himself fight for you just as he did for you in Egypt before your eyes. And in the wilderness where you have seen how the Lord, your God carried you as a man carries his son all the way that you went until you came to this place. Do you see God's care for Israel in the wilderness? He fought for them. He delivered them. He carried them and he ultimately brought them into the promised land. And Christian, God is caring for you by doing the same thing. You need not fight your own battles. God is fighting fighting for you. He sees your need and in his care, he's coming and fighting for you. And not only that, but he is carrying you through this Christian life. You see, if the Israelites, if it were up to them and their own strength to get into the promised land, they would have failed, given up, died, turned back and gone to Egypt. And if it were up to us to walk through this Christian life into eternity under our own strength, we would turn back, give up, let down. But friend, you cannot stop the plan of God. And the plan of God is to carry you into eternity via his own power. He is carrying you step by step. And just as he delivered Israel into the promised land, friend, you will be delivered into eternity. It is sure it is going to happen if you are in Christ Jesus. So nothing you are facing here and now can stop the plan of God in your life. Nothing you are facing here and now will cause God to walk away from you, abandon you, turn his back on you, stop fighting for you, stop carrying you. God will always and forever do that for you. He cares for you, Christian. 
Third point, Jesus shows us the Father in his correction of us. Now, if I could just be totally honest, church, in the last five to seven years, the portion of my theology that has shifted so much is in how I view the Father as it pertains to discipline and correction. When I first became a Christian, I'm like, there's no way! God doesn't correct us. God doesn't discipline us. But man, the the scripture spoke to me and changed my heart. Listen to some of the passages God used to change my heart. Proverbs 3. My son, do not despise the Lord's discipline or be weary of his reproof. For the Lord reproves him whom he loves as a father, the son in whom he delights. Hebrews 12. And have you forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons? My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when reproved by him. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. It is for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? If you are left without discipline in which all have participated, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Now, intuitively, we all know this is good and right. It's just not our natural disposition to see God this way. So maybe an easier example. Maybe you played in the marching band in high school. Maybe you played the tuba. All right, it's the first instrument that came to mind for me. Uh, maybe you played the tuba and, and you were not always a tuba player. You've never picked it up. But the second you picked it up, you were kind of just like this prodigy. You were just really, really good at it. You weren't perfect, but you had a ton of talent. And so maybe your band director, he saw this in you. He saw your potential. And so what did he do? He disciplined you and corrected you. He kind of rode you a little bit and he did it because he loved you. He did it because he wanted what's best for you and he saw a future for you. Maybe you could have gone to college on a scholarship to play tuba in the marching band. And so what did he do? He said, hey, are you practicing outside of school? Do you have a private tutor? Are you, uh, listen, when you play it that way, don't do it. Play it this way. Hey, that, I told you that's not how you do it. You gotta do it. And in the moment you're frustrated, you're like, stop correcting me. But you know it's for your good, and he's doing it motivated by love. And the same is true in parenting. Listen, when I watch Owen, all I see is shades of myself. And I'm like, son, how hard-headed can you be? And he's just like chasing a ball into the street without looking. He thinks the fire's pretty, so he's got to jump into it. And, and he's like, dad's power tools. Let's go play with those things. Uh, just last month, my dad and I were up in their attic because we were taking down hundreds of boxes of Christmas decorations. It took us hours. I was exhausted. And we're up there sorting through things and we hear grandpa. And my son walked all the way up the ladder, climbed into the attic, and he was carrying a sword in his hand. <laughs> it wasn't a real sword, but it was a sword nonetheless. So like, there's a father moment there where you're like, I'm proud of you, son. <laughs> but there's also like a, don't do that again. And you discipline them. And God does the same for us. And it's all motivated by love. God sees us and he corrects us because he wants what's best for us. He sees the Christ-like potential within you and within me. And he says, I want to help you reach that. I want to correct you. I want to guide you. I want to discipline you. I want to put the guardrails up in your life. And, And the reality is there's kind of two experiences in the Christian faith. When you come to Jesus by faith, you are positionally righteous. Christian, hear this. If you are in Christ, you are clothed in the righteousness of Christ. There is no more wrath of God stored up for you. All God has for you is mercy, kindness, joy, grace, and love. You are fully, freely, forever forgiven in Christ Jesus now and forevermore. When you come to Christ, this is your truth. You are positionally righteous in Christ. But there's also a second reality that in this Christian life, we are not yet functionally righteous. So we still have indwelling sin. We still live in a broken world. And so we are actively trying. The, Christ, the purpose of the Christian life is to bring your functional righteousness and line it up with your positional righteousness. This is the process in the Bible called sanctification where you grow to look like Christ. And God disciplines us and he corrects us to move our functional righteousness along, to move us towards understanding our identity in Christ, to understand our forgiveness in Christ, to understand the truth that whom the Son set free is free indeed. And so God actively corrects us to help speed that process up and move it along. 
He's gonna do this in three primary ways. God is going to correct us first to purge us of sin. Each of us has indwelling sin. It's true of all of us. Each of us has things that we struggle with and we need to put off. And so God will discipline us. He will chastise us according to Proverbs 3 to help us see our own sin and put it to death. John Owen says, be killing sin or sin will be killing you. Be killing sin or sin will be killing you. So God corrects us so that we can starve our sin, put it to death, take it out back and get rid of it. God will also correct us to produce proper affections within us. God doesn't just want us to put off sin, but God wants us to worship him alone. Christian, anyone in this room, you are what you worship. You become what you worship. That which you look at, you become like. You are what you eat, right? You know that saying? You are what you eat. You become what you worship. And all of us struggle with idolatry where we worship things that are not God. We worship finances and security and possessions and materialism and relationship and reputation. And, and, and we have fear of man that's motivating all of it. And so we become like our idols where we worship our idols. And God says, I'm gonna correct you because I want you to worship me alone. Take your eyes off of those things. They're gonna let you down and look at me. I will not let you down. I am the only one worthy of worship, awe, wonder, and your affection. So God corrects us so that our affections are properly oriented to him alone. And then finally, he corrects us to cause endurance within us. You heard it there in Hebrews chapter 12. God corrects us to help us put one step and one foot in front of the other in this Christian life. A lot of times the Christian life doesn't even feel like walking. It feels like crawling. And so God is actively motivating us with his correction saying, keep going, I'm worth it. Keep going, I'm worth it. Keep going, Jesus is better. So Jesus shows the father to us and how he cares for us and his concern for us and his correction of us. But finally, Isaiah 9 says, he is not just our father now, but he's our everlasting father our father forevermore. Um, I don't know about you. I love my dad. <clears throat> and, and the relationship with parents, it just, it just shifts over time. I talked about this a few weeks ago. When you're young, you, you think your parents are Superman and then you hit 10 and your parents are complete idiots. And then you hit 18 and you're like, man, do they have any wisdom at all? And then you go to college and you pay bills and it's really hard and you start to respect your parents. And then you hit about 30 and your house starts breaking down, your car starts breaking down, your kids start breaking down. And you're like, man, they, they are Superman. They did, wow. That was impressive. Well, I'm at the, the place now with my dad where I just love being with him. Like, I just want to be in his presence. We go golfing every once in a while. We spend a few hours together. It's just so fun. Like, it's not actively like, dad, teach me this. Or like, there's some of that. Like, dad, teach me how to fix my kitchen sink. Um, and I respect him so much. And I have so much love for him. But man, I just want to be with him. I love watching him interact with my children. I love watching him interact with Katie. I love watching him interact with you all at church. I just love being in the presence of my dad. And there's going to come a day in eternity where Jesus' concern for us isn't needed anymore. His care for us isn't needed anymore. His correction of us isn't needed anymore because he is going to recreate all things and it's going to be even better than Eden. We're going to be in his presence forevermore. All sad things are going to come untrue. All diseases will be eradicated. All tears will be wiped away. There will be no more pain, strife, illness, disease, poverty. All of that will be wiped out in this new creation. And so we won't need concern, care, or correction anymore. But we will have an everlasting father. And he will sit with us. He will dwell with us. And we will be in his presence. And we're going to watch him interact with us and interact with each other. And we are just going to want to love him and be loved by him. That's what we're looking forward to, Christian. That's our future. And while we wait in Advent, that's all that we have coming for us. So what do we do with all of this? Unbeliever, if you're not a Christian, if you're hearing all this and you're skeptical, just come to the Father. The invitation is loud and clear from Jesus. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me but it's not like you have to go through some kind of obstacle course to get to the Father. 
It's easy. Turn from your sin. Trust in him. He will be your father now and forevermore. For the believer, come back to the father. One of my favorite parables in the New Testament is Luke 15, when we see the parable of the prodigal son, where the younger son takes off and he spoils his inheritance and he parties in a foreign land and it goes south and it doesn't work out and he comes running back home. And it's not like he had to earn his way back into his dad's good graces, but actually in that story, the dad is standing on the patio, looking out at the gates, waiting for his son's return. And the second he sees his son on the horizon, he sprints towards him and he tells everyone, hey, we're throwing a party, get the good meat, get the fine wine, let's do this thing, let's blow it out. My son has come home. Believer, if you've wandered from the father, maybe at the hands of hurt from an earthly father, maybe because of your own sin, maybe because of some type of rejection you've experienced, hear me, come back to the father. He is perfect, blameless, spotless, and he will be your father now and forevermore. And all he wants to do is bring you up on his lap embrace you, look you in the eye and say, I'm proud of you. I love you and you're mine. There's nothing you can do to change that. Come to the father. Let's pray. Father, what a privilege it is to call you father. Dead in our sins and our trespasses, enemies of you, orphans, but you saw us as yours and adopted us into your family and called us your children. And now we know in this life, we have you looking down upon us. You have concern for us. You have care for us. You correct us to grow us in our holiness. And we know that what's coming for us is a day when all things will be made new and perfect and we will be with you forevermore. We look forward to that day. What a privilege, what an honor it is to call you father. We once were without fathers, but now we have one. And we thank you for that, God. I pray for those in this room that are carrying particular wounds at the hand of a father. Would you cover that? Would you heal that? And would you cause them to see you clearly as the perfect heavenly father who cares for them, loves them, and will not leave them? I pray for those who once knew you as father, but have walked away to a foreign land to party. I pray you would bring them back, that you would welcome them with open arms. You would embrace them and say, I'm proud of you. I love you. You're mine. In Christ's name, amen.